couple of years, the emerging economies have been the place to go. If you wanted to feel optimistic, you'd jump on a plane and head to Sao Paulo or Delhi or Beijing. But this year, 2012, uh, there was a pretty sharp slowdown in the big emerging economies. And I think there's now a lot of questioning as to whether they can keep up the stellar growth rates that we've all gotten used to, whether there's something bigger changing there, whether, in fact, the growth models themselves need to be relooked at. And that's what we're going to look at in this session, what's ahead for the emerging economies in 2013. Um, and we have two people, two outstanding individuals who are both known for very contrarian, and sometimes I hope they disagree with each other, views on the emerging economies. We're going to start with Bill Easterly, professor of economics at NYU, co-director co of the NYU Development Research Institute, and probably best known to you for his books, which have bo both been bestsellers, The White Man's Burden, Why the West's Efforts to Aid the Rest Have Done So Much Harm and So Little Good. A very, uh, a very non-provocative book, as you can tell from the title. <laughs> And uh, The Elusive Quest for Growth, um, how that they've both, both of those books, I think, fundamentally changed the way that many people thought about aid, growth, and development. Foreign Policy Magazine named Bill as one of the top 100 global public intellectuals. He's one of the most influential voices in this field, Bill Easterly. <laughs> so, what's going to happen to these bricks? Have they lost their luster? And... Uh, Will they regain it? What are your predictions? Well, I want to focus on one brick in particular, which is China. And we're talking a lot already about the Chinese economic slowdown. And I think this is really a, a major moment for development thinking, and not only for the world economy as a whole, because the whole idea of the authoritarian growth miracle that China has done so much to promote is really over at this point. Let me, let me give you a couple insights into why it might be over. The first is simply that authoritarian growth miracles don't last. I want to ask a question of you, the audience. How many of you have heard of the Togolese growth miracle? The Togolese growth miracle. The Togolese growth miracle. I'm really surprised okay. that Can't more of you. Of this can one. Just raise your hand if you've heard of the Togolese growth miracle. Uh, I, I thought we would have a better informed <laughs> audience than anyone. Um, well, the reason you haven't heard of it is it only lasted from 1960 to 75, and then after that, things didn't go that well. And the point of this example is that authoritarian growth miracles don't last. They just don't last. They, they go on for a while, but authoritarian systems are prone to boom and bust, and the booms don't last forever. And we keep thinking that this Chinese boom is going to last forever. We're sort of thinking like uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff have said in a different context, that this time is different. This boom is going to last forever. Well, it's not. It's going to come to an end. It's already coming to an end. It's already slowing down. And my official prediction is going to slow down a lot more. And why does that give us an insight into the whole idea of the authoritarian growth miracle? Let me take a drink of water before I give you this profound insight. <laughs> so the authoritarian growth miracle was really never an authoritarian miracle to begin with. And let me just make two simple points to, to emphasize that. One is that we've all along thought that the effect of political and economic freedom was not on the, the change in income, but on the level of per capita income that countries attain. So free countries, both with both political and economic freedom, are rich countries. Countries with heavy political repression, economic repression, are poor countries. So, you know, North America versus Africa at the extremes. And so what does that imply? It implies that when you see rapid growth, one possible thing that could be going on, and I'm going to tell you was going on in China, is what you have is changes predicting changes. You have a big change in freedom, and that change in freedom predicts the change in income, which we call rapid economic growth. So what happened in China? You had one of the worst totalitarian systems in history until 1978, and then you had a big increase in freedom. You had a huge increase in economic freedom, and you even had some increase in political freedom. 
because compared to the totalitarian system, compared to Mao's Great Leap Forward, Cultural Revolution, Chinese people today are much more free, even politically. And so this change in freedom released all the energies and the tremendous dynamism of the Chinese people. And you got this rapid economic growth. But if you want that growth to continue, you're going to have to keep changing freedom in the right direction. And so that's why, uh, that's the, the storyline that I'm going to give you as to why the Chinese miracle will not last. And if I have time, I'll illustrate with an example from The Onion. As long as a quick example from The Onion. Go ahead. That, that profound sort of insight. I thought that would buy me extra time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, I don't know how many of you heard this story recently that um, The Onion, which I hope all of you know is a satirical newspaper, uh, declared uh, North Korea's leader, uh, what's his name, Kim Jong-un, uh, the sexiest man alive. <laughs> and um, the Chinese uh, Communist Party official newspaper, The People's Daily, uh, didn't realize this was a satire and they reprinted it seriously straight up. You know, that <laughs> congratulations to Kim Jong-un for being named the sexiest man alive. Um, now, this, I think, is a little bit funny, um, but I think there's a little bit of an insight into the chi current Chinese leadership there also. Uh, if, if the leadership only allows kind of fawning worship of the leadership, and certainly would not allow this kind of sat satirical irreverence towards a leader, then they, they don't even recognize satire when they see it. They've never, they've never seen satire before. And so they, they don't recognize it when it comes along. So it may seem absurd that you could possibly mistake uh, an onion story for a real, a real story, but they did, and that's why. And the lesson for this is that the, the fundamental flaw of an authoritarian system is you have no feedback, and you need feedback to autocorrect, to fix the problems that are already emerging in the boom, and when the bus comes to prevent the bus from being too deep. That's what's missing in China. That's why the growth miracle is not going to continue. We now know that thanks to the onion. <laughs> <laughs> I have some, a lot of questions about this, but I think to make the debate more interesting, I'm going to first have Dambiza join us. Dambiza Moyo, who is uh, another um, very influential writer on development who has shaken up conventional wisdom, another author of several best-selling books, the most well-known of which I think is Dead Aid, Why Aid is Not Working and How There is a Better Way for Africa. But this year she um, published Winner Takes All, China's Race for Resources and What It Means for the World. Dambisa has also been named one of the 100 most influential people in the world, but this time by Time magazine. Dambisa, what are your predictions? What's going to happen in 2013? Good morning. Um, all I can say is, oh, ye of little faith. Um, Bill, I absolutely love and adore you. And I know we're on the same side on the aid issue, but I think you're absolutely wrong when it comes all right, to Excellent. All right. So um, I don't want to get swayed uh, immediately into arguing why I think Bill is wrong. I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to do that in a minute. But I'm here to give my prediction for 2013. And I think it's all about the emerging, particularly the frontier markets. Um, why do I say that? By the way, you're probably saying, what the hell are the frontier markets? It's basically the ones that aren't in the BRICS. And we'll talk about the BRICS, I'm sure, in a minute. But I'm talking about a lot of Africa, a lot of South America, uh, much of uh, Eastern Europe, and parts of the Middle East, and uh, other parts of, of Asia. Why do I love this story? Um, let's just look at serious macroeconomics, basic macroeconomics, capital, labor, productivity, the three key ingredients that drive growth. Let's take a look at what's happening in the Western countries first. In terms of capital, we know the story, debt, deficits, fiscal cliff, all that. In terms of labor, both in terms of quality and quantity of labor, there are issues. In terms of quantity, we know that the story of the uh, aging populations and c concerns around pension fund financing. But also in terms of quality, if you look at the OECD statistics around what they have, this is something called the PISA statistics, where they measure the performance um, in mathematics, science, and reading, um, and rank countries every three years, you can see where the problem is. Countries like the United States and across Europe were in the top three about a decade ago. Today, they rank in the number 27, 28, and they're in that, around that number. And then finally, you have productivity. Now, productivity generally is this X factor. It's, it's supposed to account for about 60% of why one country grows and another one doesn't. Um, but let's just say it's everything from pure productivity, how efficient we are at using capital and labor, but more generally it includes things like 
rule of law, political dynamics, um, how open the business, uh, for business the environment is. So we know what's happening there. Productivity declines in Europe are well known, and we, again, I won't spend too much time on that because that's not my prediction. My prediction is look at this framework, capital, labor, and productivity, and apply it to the emerging markets, and you'll see why I'm incredibly bullish for 2013 and for the years ahead. In terms of capital, these economies by and large do not have the, the debt burden that many of these uh, other countries are facing right now. Places like Africa, debt to GDP ratio for the sovereigns is around 40% compared to over 100% in places like Greece and, and Italy. Um, why is that important? Because these are countries are not suffering from the deleveraging problem that uh, many other countries are going through right now. In terms of labor dynamics, 60 to 70% of the emerging world is under the age of 25. In places like Uganda, under 50, uh, over 50% 50 is under the age of 15. Significant um, possibilities around labor. Of course, there are issues around youth employment, and again, we can talk about that once I sit down. But once again, a really interesting story. We're seeing urbanization really increasing quite rapidly in these places. I was just in Lagos. Places like Lagos, but also Mexico City, where I was in May, um, we are talking about 30% increases year on year in urbanization. A real opportunity for delivery of goods and services, but also a real opportunity for economic growth. And then there's the issue of total factor productivity, which I mentioned to you. In virtually all statistics, things like um, political uh, improvements in terms of democracy, in terms of freedoms, and, and actually, um, I really have to have this debate with you, Bill, because this is really essential. Fine with me. Um, <laughs> but in terms of um, in doing business surveys, countries like Rwanda have been ranked number one by the World Bank as the most improved. And if you just look around the emerging markets, look around the frontier markets, you'll see a very credible story. Um, let me close by telling you this. 90% of the world's population, 90% of 7 billion people live in the emerging markets. The genie is out of the bottle. They want to see improvements in their livelihoods, and they are going to see improvements in their li livelihoods. Fortunately, for many of the frontier economies, their success and or failure is no longer hitched to the global economy as a whole um, because of what we're seeing in terms of deleveraging and this ongoing um, aftermath of the financial crisis. There will be issues. I do think it will be bumpy, but I think fundamentally the story is very strong, and this is why we're seeing an increasing number of countries pivoting towards China, where I think the story is also very positive. Thank you very much. Well. We obviously have to talk about China, where one of you is deeply pessimistic and one of you is optimistic. But Dambiza, first of all, just briefly, tell us what the front, which are the frontier markets, because you, you cite this story of capital, labor, and productivity, obviously, you know, the basic building blocks of growth, but you could say that about the BRICs, frankly, and the Brazils, the Indias, and indeed the Chinas, and they've all slowed very dramatically. So True. Those, the, those ingredients don't always combine to give well, you Well, I think growth. there's a clear delineation between, shall we call them, the um, advanced emerging economies and these frontier economies. And the delineation is how um, uh, related or how integrated the BRICs are to developed markets, how much exposure do they have? So we know about China and the United States, that's the classic Chimerica story, which is that in terms of trade, in terms of foreign direct investment and, uh, and flows, heavily um, dependent on the United States and Europe. Again, let me pick my own continent, Africa. Um, a continent which has got a billion people um, is less than 2% of world trade, it's less than 2% of foreign direct investment. The real engine in growth in these countries is actually not going to be trade, uh, unfortunately. Um, I think it's gonna be a lot of domestic demand. And if you look at the at valuations of the banks, if you look at what's tr how things are trading um, in the local markets in these places, I think the story is very credible and it's very much hitched to a domestic story rather than being necessarily integrated to the West. And it doesn't depend on commodity prices because that's clearly been a big driver of African growth. That's a fantastic time. question. Um, it, it, it does to some extent, clearly, um, but it's not entirely the case. And let me, if you don't mind, give you a statistic. Um, today there are about 1,000 stocks that trade in Africa um, on 19 exchanges. And over 85% of those stocks are non-commodities. So I think if people look at Africa and say, oh, it's just a commodity store, you're missing out on one of the biggest trades that is going to, is occurring and will continue to occur. Have a look at how um, the performance of the markets this year in Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, they are significantly up and actually are the one of the, amongst the best performers driven by the banks, which obviously banking is the, the first sort of uh, leg up. Uh, in terms of economic development. But this story is being replicated you know, in places like Colombia, in Peru, in places like um, in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. So it actually is about this desperate or this insatiable demand for goods and services that is not necessarily hitched to the commodity story. And, but I will say, though, just to give, uh, give Bill his due, um, 
of course, we know that China is slowing. I just don't think it's a hard landing. And, it, and you know, I think that it's pretty clear that they've had a slowdown. I think it's kind of uh, managing itself out now. Um, and of course, to the extent that China is the, the biggest buyer uh, of these raw commodities, um, it does, it will impact the big commodity producers. But as I said, I think that they, it will be balanced out by domestic demand. Let's, let's focus on China, because not only is it the most, certainly the biggest and, and the most important of the emerging economies, you clearly do have very different views on it. And, and Bill, let's start with you, because I sense a somewhat of a kind of determinism in your view. You know, unless there is political reform, you're saying growth will slow. Well, doesn't, is there not any capacity for this new leadership, and we've just had a leadership transition in China, to implement the kinds of economic reforms that would be needed to get the next stage of growth, you know, to break up the domestic monopolies and so forth? Or do you think they just cannot do it unless there is broader political reform? Uh, I think the latter, that you cannot do it unless there's, there's political reform. You really need to have an open, honest, intellectual debate going on within society to get the, the feedback you need to make the correct economic reforms. Uh, they've been able to get away with it for a long time, much longer than any other autocratic growth miracle ever has. Uh, but it's, it's, it's running out now. It it's just cannot go on without having uh, you know, honest, critical feedback on what's wrong with the current system. And you only get that when you allow freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of the have, press. You do have some feedback. I mean, look at Weibo. Look at you know, the Chinese Twitter. You, have, you, have a, you do have the capacity for some kind of criticism of the government. Is it not less well, black and white than you? What, what is the minimum set of things that you think you need for the growth miracle to continue? Well, the fact that you have a Chinese Twitter and that uh, China does not allow engaging with the, the rest of the world on Twitter, there's sort of like a, instead of an iron curtain, we have now a Twitter curtain where the, the autocratic countries are behind <laughs> the Twitter curtain, Russia, China, Iran, you know. The, uh, and those are precisely the countries where you not only don't allow the internal debate, but you don't allow the international spread of ideas that you need to keep debate, to keep growth going. Interesting. I must say, when I'm, every time I'm in China, I don't feel a dearth of, um, you know, things coming from the rest of the world there. But Dan Biza, tell me, you are clearly much more upbeat about China. Um, do you think, to use, to use Bill's term, the authoritarian growth miracle will continue? No, I don't think it will continue, but let me just throw out a couple of statistics. Um, first of all, um, by some estimates, around 50 million, 5 zero million Chinese leave every year for school, for business, tourism, um, and virtually all of them go back. Um, the other statistic is if you look at some of the, uh, the data that's coming from, uh, from McKinsey around uh, education, there's, a, there's what they call a, a, a student visa. So after you do your undergraduate degree or after you, you finish your studies in the U.S., you get a one-year extra uh, period to work in the United States. 92% of people in the emerging markets, primarily Chinese, head back immediately to get their degrees from here. If things were so awful, I think we would just have a flood more of people coming from there. Now, you might say, well, that's anecdotal. Don't really buy it. But let me remind you. Let's just think about the United States. And this was something that um, I heard last week at Brookings. Um, the uh, um, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer, who I don't like to recommend other people's books. I want you to buy my book, but um, <laughs> I will recommend that you get his book. It's called Making Democracy Work. But he reminded us in this room that the United States survived for many, many decades, in fact, over a century, um, without having the sort of universal suffrage, human rights in the way that we live today. In fact, if I may just give you the specifics, the US Constitution was written in 1787. And that's the we the people. It was very clearly articulated. And, and actually, there was a lot of buy-in conceptually, which is, by the way, the same in China today. There's a lot of buy-in conceptually that there was supposed to be a free and fair society. The fact of the matter is that it took the United States until 1956, Brown versus the Board of Education, before you had universal suffrage and fairness in this country. So it was quite possible to have the Industrial Revolution. It was quite possible to build institutions, to have sustainable growth that actually has, has propelled the world to uh, new levels of, of, uh, of uh, income, in, uh, of income, uh, income levels and so on without having a, um, a, democrat a democratic society in the way that we know it today. Does that mean that I'm say saying that it's great that we have authoritarian rule? I'm, no, I'm not. I am just saying I think we need to be a little bit more patient because it's not the case that in China they're not having the discussions. They are having discussions around this. The question is about implementation, and this is the biggest grief, um, sort of gripe I hear from Chinese people every time I go there, they say, we get it, we get it. We know we need to have democracy. Tell us how, specifics. 
not theory specific. How do we actually implement democracy? And actually, a lot of work has been done. There's a fantastic piece that was written a few years ago about democracy on the ground. And we know that they actually have some mayoral elections. It's not perfect, but it is moving in the right direction. And I think we need to be more supportive. Bill, you wanted to comment on that? Yeah, well, let's talk about the US, of course. Uh, anyway, this is a session about the emerging economies. <laughs> I know, but let's. Yeah, so we're talking about the US. For but all right, let's, let's, let's US, talk about it briefly. The US example is very relevant for the emerging, emerging markets in the long run. Again, I, we're, we're having a long run discussion, which I think is actually useful to, to see the short run clearly. So of course, you never have a perfect uh, democracy. Um, there's some evidence from the current behavior of our current Congress that we still don't have a perfect democracy. Um, but what you have is you have an ideal that was set at the beginning in the US in 1776, that all men are created equal, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the consent of the governed. Uh, and that ideal makes it possible to have this positive political increase in freedom where the double standard in which you know, white males are equal, but not women and not blacks, that that double standard is progressively eroded over time. It's that ideal. Lincoln appealed to that ideal for the Emancipation Proclamation. Martin Luther King could appeal to that ideal for the Civil Rights Revolution. That's what makes positive change possible. And the tragedy in development is that the ideal has never even been recognized as a principle in and of itself, that there's a the real double standard now is between the rich countries and the poor countries, that we recognize democratic rights as a beautiful ideal for the rich countries, but not for the poor countries. Until that happens, not only China, but all of the poor countries are going to be condemned to not have this positive change in freedom that you need so much for long-run development. But let me, let me just, can I, can I just push back with, one, with a, another of the BRICS, India, which you know, by the standards of what you've just laid out is actually doing pretty well. It's a huge democracy. It's, in fact, got very many parallels with the US earlier in the 20th century, the late 19th century. And yet, if you look at what's happened, and I know this is a short-term prism, but you look at what's happened to Indian growth, huge excitement, in, you know, three, four, five years ago, double-digit growth in India, fantastic human capital potential, very young population. Growth has completely stalled. I mean, it's now at 5%, which in Indian terms is very, very low. Sclerotic government, inability to do reforms, a huge number of kind of supply-side problems, which are... You know, they're different in nature to those in China, but they're not different in the sense that there's an awful lot of things that everyone knows need to get done that aren't getting done. One is an authoritarian regime, one is a democracy. They both have problems which are slowing growth. So uh, is, is perhaps this analysis a little bit too deterministic? Well, it's too deterministic if you expect, expect it to fit every, every day's data point. <laughs> uh, we don't... Uh, we don't decide on global warming depending on whether today is a warm day or not. Um, you know that, um, so, so, you know, we're talking about long-run predictions. In, India is a democracy, and I think its outlook is a, already has the, the growth miracle that it already had, had a lot to do with it being a democracy, and I think its long-run prognosis is much better than China's because it is a democracy. And, of course, it's, democracy is much more than just majority vote elections. There's a lot of democratic principles that are still not recognized in India. There's massive corruption and vote buying and, and massive violation of the rights of the poor by the rich and by well-connected elites. All of this stuff is the stuff that you have to transition out of to realize your democratic potential. Let's open this to a broader conversation, either on the very big picture of uh, democracy and its importance for development, or if you have more specific questions about 2013. Yes, gentlemen there, five rows back. Yeah, yes, China. Uh, the one, of course, with regard to the perspective on liberty in China, one should never forget Tiananmen Square. Nevertheless, um, what's your prediction in the next five years whether the party will win or the internet? Considering that some uh, 25, 30 years ago in Poland, the facts won over the party. Bill. Yeah, well, it's hard enough to predict in economics. I think it's even harder to predict in uh, political science when exactly the democratic breakthrough will happen. I'm hopeful that it will happen in China sooner rather than later because of uh, actually something that you mentioned, Dambisa, the fact that so many uh, Chinese intellectuals and well-educated engineers and scientists and economists are going back to China, that they are actually going to be part of the vanguard that brings back the, the ideals uh, that they've seen in other societies back to China, that that's actually a sign of hope. There was another question. Yes, lady here at the very front row. That's a very good question. Does, is Singapore the, uh, 
exception to your um, broad <laughs> view of the world. <laughs> it's uh, always cited, right? Can we add Chile and ta Taiwan while you're at it? And, and so, a couple of countries in Africa. In fact, more than a couple. Africa. Yeah, well, let's, uh, let's not forget what, what uh, one of the basic points that I was trying to get across, which is that growth, which is why we get so excited about East Asia, is about, ch is about changes, and it responds to changes in freedom. So Singapore had a remarkable pos also had a remarkable positive change in economic freedom in, during the modern era when it, uh, when it you know, opened up in a massive way to world trade and became a huge tra trade and finance center. Uh, not so much on, politi on political, and um, actually Singapore already has slowed down from the glory days of a very rapid growth. It's slowed down by several percentage points in growth over the last couple of decades. So the authoritarian growth miracle already has slowed down. I think Singapore will also have to politically liberalize if it wants to return to the days of higher growth. But isn't that slowed down partly because it's just become richer? And as you become an advanced economy, you tend to slow down. Um, um, but I well, that's uh, you well. You could <laughs> you could turn that around and say part of the reason that uh, the autocracies grow fast is that they're poor and they can take advantage of catch-up potential, and the autocrat doesn't get all the credit. <laughs> it's a somewhat tautological. Um, uh, no. Actually, there's a lady right there. Let's go for that one there. Uh, you've taken the mic away, but that's okay. Uh, Hi, uh, I'm interested in the political reform in China. I mean, does it have to be exactly the same as the West, Western democracy system? Bill, another one for you. Does it have yeah, to be? No, I mean, no, uh, nobody has to imitate exactly any other country. I think it's about ideals and principles and not about the exact institutions that other countries use. Uh, I mean, uh, Nobody has ever found a very good way for the consent of the governed other that, that does not include majority vote elections. I think that one is going to be hard to deal with. Uh, but the principles are really about you know, the power, the, the checks on the power of the government to do bad things to individuals. It's about ind the principles are of individual rights. There are many ways to protect the individual against the power of the government and, the, and to give individuals their rights. So no, it doesn't have to be an exact imitation. I'm just going to broaden that. Dambiza, can you perhaps comment uh, on particularly the countries in Africa? Because you have some of your frontier economies are democracies, and some are really absolutely not democracies. And do you see any difference in the, in, in the ones that you think have particular potential based on their political systems? So I guess my fundamental view is, and maybe it's my bias because I'm an economist and so not a political scientist, is I, I do not think that um, the political infrastructure is a prerequisite for economic growth. And some of the questions that we've had here around Singapore, Taiwan, and so on, are, are basically touching on that point, that you don't necessarily have, uh, have to have democratic, a democracy um, in place. In fact, um, Freedom House has done a lot of work in this. Most of the so-called democracies around the world are actually illiberal democracies. And there is enough evidence to show that if you have the right workings of an economy, you can deliver economic growth. And what you really want, I would say, is to drive economic growth first so that you can create a middle class that's able to hold the government accountable. So it's kind of, it's kind of futile, if you will, to have lots of people going around and standing and voting when actually they're not able to hold the government accountable, which is really the reason I, why I wrote my first book, because I thought it was kind of absurd to have what you, you deem to be democratic principles but actually are not um, really, they're quite irrelevant in a place where the government is not able, you can't hold the government accountable. Um, but let me just pick up on something that, um, that Bill said earlier. This point about values um, and idea, ideals or sort of the ethos of how, a country, how countries operate, I think this is a really important point because there is a schism between emerging markets and developed nations. Um, and if you go back to the 1948 Declaration of Human Rights, it, it becomes it's very clear why we're in this sort of having this discussion now. In 1948, the definition, according to Western countries, of human rights was political freedoms, democracy, the ability to hold your government accountable through um, uh, sort of media and press and so on, press freedoms. At that time, even at that time, there was a debate because most of the emerging markets said, well, to us, human rights are the ability to deliver food, security, ability to deliver education and health care. And actually, that, that bridge that, that gap between these two sort of uh, schools of thought has really never 
actually converged. And I think this is where the issue lies, because I, I, I strongly believe that we will get the political reforms, but it cannot be shoehorned into these countries. What you need is to make sure that they evolve in, the way, in a way that's organic. And coming back to the question about, does it, need to be, does it need to look like the Western democracy? No, it doesn't. It needs to evolve organically for the local um, market, the local environment, so that it actually sticks and, this, and so that it's actually sustainable over a longer period of time. Um, can I just say one last thing, and I promise, yeah, I'll just say very quickly, just bear in mind, um, and I know everyone in this room knows this, you've got the United States, largest economy, $15 trillion GDP, democracy as its political ethos, private capitalism as its economic um, paradigm. You've got China, second largest economy in the world, 7.5, I think it is, a trillion GDP. It's got, basically, we're sitting here and saying no democracy, um, and it has state capitalism. These two countries have the same income inequality right now measured yeah. in Gini coefficients. Actually, China's is worse. And so if you think, well, it's, it's only a little, marginally worse, it's like 45 versus 47, but the point being, and you, we could sit here and talk about whether, you know, trajectory, but the, again, thinking about the emerging world, policymakers across the emerging world have to make the decision, which model do we pick? You know, we, we want to have democracy, we love democracy, but is it really the case that it needs to be set in place before economic development can occur? And I think the jury's still out, and my view is it's not. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Um, goodness me, loads of people. I'm so sorry. Um, yes, lady there, five, five rows back, six rows back. Oh, oh no, up. somebody, I've got an uproar. Okay, right. <laughs> I'm going to lose control of this. Um, uh, all right, you have that. We're going to have two more questions. Gentleman there, you take that one. Okay, uh, my original question was to be directed to Professor Easterly about Amartya Sen's claim that the 1948 Declaration of Human Rights does provide a basis for generalizing uh, the Declaration of Independence to the whole world. And it also does include, I think contrary to what uh, the other professors said, it does include so-called positive rights in it as well. And I think this is why Sen is so enthused about it. And I'd like to hear your comments bo of both of you uh, about that. Can I just cap? We will, we will get to that. I'm just going to get one or two other questions and have you both answer them. Um, uh, where was, yes, lady here, four rows back. Uh, my, question, my question is with regards to Africa. Um, and I was in West Africa a couple of years ago, and from the educated population, there was a very strong sentiment that um, stopped the aid. And my question is around... That crazy idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, my question is around innovation, because there are people doing important things there, like Clinton and Goldman Sachs with 10,000 women. And so without that external money, how, do, how, how does that economy actually grow and develop that engine for innovation? Thank you. Well, you've got the right people to ask about Stop the Aid. Uh, very briefly, because we are out of time, how about you take the UN? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, the sad thing about the UN Declaration of Human Rights is the, uh, the UN agencies themselves did not respect this declaration. The World Bank, the organization that I know best from being there, uh, in prison there for 15 years, um, um, uh, the, the last pre outgoing president, Zelik, never once used the word democracy during his entire term. He never gave it, I, and I had a blog that was tormenting him about this, so I know this uh, firsthand. And, uh, and when I questioned his spokesman, he, he agreed with me. Yes, he's never used the word democracy. He's not allowed to use the word democracy. So obviously, the, the World Bank was not even endorsing the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, and instead, they were doing things like giving lots of aid to autocrats like uh, Meles in Ethiopia, who is using the aid to, and this was documented by Human Rights Watch, and yet the World Bank did nothing about this. Uh, Mellis was using the aid to starve his political opponents and to give food relief to anyone who was a political supporter. Now, when the World Bank itself is not recognizing that, uh, that basic human right, then I argue there is very much a double standard. Thank you. Dambiza, very briefly. So, Eight two America. things. First of all, there's not a single country in the history of the world that has achieved long-term economic growth and reduced poverty in a meaningful way by relying on aid. Not one. So the notion that we should sit here and say, oh, woe is we poor Africans, we need to give them more aid, is rubbish. Um, second of all, Zambia, which is my country two months ago, well, first of all, two years ago, all I heard from people was Dambiza is completely insane. These countries cannot go to the market. They can't do capital markets. That's left for the other countries. Africa's ring-fenced. Paul Collier calls it shearing 
splitting off from the rest of the world. Two months ago, Zambia did a bond, $750 million, unsecuritized. So it wasn't basically based on copper flows or anything. Like that. Unsecuritized, um, $750 million. It came, it came through, so it, became, it was more aggressively priced than Italy, Spain, or Portugal. And not only that, it was 15 times oversubscribed. That is the way you create economic development. That is the way you hold governments accountable. So just get the aid system out of your mind. Whatever Clinton and all these other agencies are doing, fantastic, but that is not going to create sustainable 7%, at least 7% growth is what we need on that continent and around the emerging world. These, these, these um, uh, sort of marginal interventions, these um, relatively small uh, beer interventions are not going to create economic growth. You know what creates economic growth. We know how to create jobs. We know that trade is better than, than, than aid. So instead of having large subsidy programs that lock African produce out of the West, start there. Get rid of your common agriculture policy and get rid of those programs, and then we can talk about economic growth in Africa. Thank you very much. You can see why these are the two, most, two of the most provocative voices in the business. Thank you.